Welcome back to the show where we run you through all the Dolphins news you need to know about. After running through the news you need to know about, we run you through the fan Q&A where we answer fans' questions. Not a lot of news on the news uh, docket today, ladies and gentlemen. It's obviously a very quiet part of the NFL season or off season. Um, so hopefully we'll get a good show out for you despite of that. So this first news story comes from Pro Football. Ball rumors as it usually does. The Dolphins have agreed to terms with Austin Jackson. The Dolphins have agreed to terms with uh, the second of their first three first round picks, Austin Jackson. Uh, Field Yates of ESPN.com tweets. Um, so, yeah, great news, obviously. In terms of their entire draft class, this is who the Dolphins have signed and who have they haven't signed out of their 2020 NFL draft class. Two attack of Loa has been signed. Austin Jackson obviously has been signed. Raekwon Davis signed. Brandon Jones signed. Solomon Kinley signed. Jason Strobridge signed. Curtis Weaver signed. Blake Ferguson signed. Malcolm Perry signed. These who these are the players who have not been signed yet. Uh, Robert Hunt ha- obviously hasn't been signed. The second round guard slash tackle out of Louisiana. Uh, and Noah Igmanogany is the only other one who hasn't been signed. The first round pick. Uh, at the end of the first round, corner out of Auburn. So those are the players that have not been signed. There's only two, Robert Hunt and Noe Ibnagi. So it's great that we got Austin Jackson locked up. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, Austin Jackson had a you know a really unfortunate last year in college where he didn't have an offseason due to the fact that he had to uh, donate bone marrow to his little sister. Uh, and it's kind of similar situation now where he's not going to really have a normal offseason in the NFL. A lot of these rookies won't. So it's kind of a really misfortunate, just a lot of misfortune uh, to the start uh, of both seasons for him the last two years. So that kind of sucks. He's a young player, comes from a really good lineage of USC tackles, though, um, in terms of first round picks that have come out of USC that have been tackles. It's a really good track record. Um, so at least he has, I guess, the you know some kind of cosmic uh, power going for him there. Um, he's a very talented player. Obviously got it, like I said, got a, got off to a slow start to his college season before he was drafted. Then really started to kick the tires up again as the season went on. Started to get his feet under him, uh, and it sucks that he's kind of having the same, kind of has the same circumstance. Uh, circumstances now where he, it's it's going to be weird how this offseason is going because you I you know rookie minicamp would have already happened I believe so it sucks that they're not going to have a normal offseason especially with the huge draft class that we have um, and uh, you know we'll see how things work out but it, it's definitely it's looking worse and worse as we get closer to the NFL season that yeah it's it's looking like either the season will be delayed I feel like or they're just not going to have an offseason. Uh, or a very short one. I know I don't think they'll have a preseason. If they will, it probably be a game or two, maybe. Uh, so it's kind of unfortunate start to his NFL career and an unfortunate start to his college career last year. Uh, so a very weird start to his football career for Austin Jackson. But I, I feel he's a talented dude, young. Um, we'll see how far, he, how fast he gets into the starting lineup. I hope it's fast. He's obviously the most talented guy on the roster at that position, and he obviously plays a very important position, uh, and in one position that we lacked greatly last year with the early, you know, the very quick departure of Laramie Tunsil. We had to really just throw people in that line uh, at that position, uh, and it was a big hole on that roster. So he's, you know, he's got, you know, he's he has to fill a, a pretty big shoes there, and hopefully he can do that early on. Um. And again, we all, I think we can all agree that he has very, very big op- upside um, for his NFL career. I'm very excited to see where it goes. Um, so let's move on from this. Um, let's move on to this new story that comes from the Sun Sentinel. Uh, it actually comes from Omar Kelly. Uh, Dolphins Tua Tagovailoa begins working with doctors and trainers at Davies uh, at the Davy Team facility. Um, the Miami Dolphins. Which is great news. Um, I don't know how much we really want to read into this. Uh, but it's nice that he's already started working out in the facility, uh, which is good news. And we actually have some news off of that. This comes from Sports Illustrated. Um, and this is to attack about his health status. The Dolphins haven't been able to get a first-hand look. Okay, hang on. Maybe this is the wrong one.
Okay, so here, here it is. This is an update on Tua's health. Uh, his trainer gave him a glowing review and um, when he got his hands on him, I guess, is when he started working out. I guess this isn't very related to uh, that news story. I apologize for that. But it's just nice that the Dolphins finally get him in the facility and are working him out and stuff of that nature. And he obviously, uh, that news story was saying that he got a uh, glowing review on his hip uh, when he was working out with this trainer, which I guess is not very related. I don't know why I thought those two things were related. Anyway, uh, sorry for for that, but yeah, there you go. Uh, two is looking good. Two is looking healthy. Two is in the facility. He's working out, uh, and that's good news. Uh, this next news story comes from CBS. Um, and this is the first mainstream, I guess, um, article that I saw that, hey, maybe the Dolphins will be challengers for the AFC East title. Um, and this comes from Mark Sessler of NFL Network, who is the only one I've ever seen, and I thought this was relevant because this is the only guy, analyst, that I've seen actually think, oh, these guys actually have a chance. Um, he said, quote, this division is weird. <laughs> This is, what is, this is what he said. I know everyone just tickets the Bills to win at this point, but Brian Flores and Ryan Fitzpatrick, that combination, to me, was good down the stretch. They may leap into the win count a little quicker than some people think. I just think they're fun, is what he said about the Dolphins. So I thought it was just cool to bring up someone who's actually like, oh yeah, these guys are actually good enough to challenge for that title. And I bring up a lot of examples of last year of, you know, and again, we went 5-4 and four down the stretch. We beat a lot of good teams in that um, in that 5-4 and four stretch. We were scoring a lot of points. Our offense was top 10 in the league. Um, it was the best part of the team. That position, the offense got better with the, influ- uh, the, the, the uh, influx of offensive line talent um, into that room, and hopefully that... Um, positional group of the offensive line gets better because the sky is limited at that point. Really good receiver core, really good t- uh, receiving tight end Mike Kosicki. Uh, and obviously Ryan Fitzpatrick played very well last year for us. So it's just, I think it's a bright future for this team. The defense got significantly better. We don't even have to get into it. Not to mention how tough we played our AFC East opponents. We, sh- we should have swept the Jets if it wasn't for the refs last year. Uh, even though they had the better team at the time, um, we still we should have still should have swept them. Um, if it wasn't for one of the dumbest flags of the year last year. We played the Bills very tough last year, um, even though they had obviously a 10-6 and six team, and we weren't, you know, we just didn't have the, that kind of firepower. Um, and obviously we beat the, pa- the Patriots and Gillette. So when you look at our AFC's track record last year, it's like, okay, well, they had this roster that was not very good, and... Everyone in that division had a better team at the time, and somehow this coaching staff was able to put together a product that was competitive, uh, even though it might not show it. If you watched the team last year, and especially down the stretch, and you watched them against AFC East divisional opponents, it was close, and uh, we still did damage, despite the fact that we had lesser, a lesser roster, so... Um, you know, I think all of those things, and not to mention the fact that we were we greatly improved from last year uh, with our roster and really improved it. Uh, I feel like I don't understand why more people aren't talking about us as contenders for that title, and especially if you look at the quarterback uh, situation in the AFC East, it's not great. Uh, Sam Darnold is overrated. We've been through this a million times. Josh Allen, I'm not gonna hate on Josh Allen too too much, but you know he obviously has a lot to prove in terms of a passer. Um, you know, Jared Stidham hasn't even played a regular season game yet, and he didn't really look all that great in preseason, despite what other people think. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I think that's a little overblown as well. So it's wide open. The division is wide open. There should be no reason the Dolphins shouldn't be able to at least challenge for that crown and get in. And, and I want to say this: people have brought up the hard schedule that we have. Well, everyone in the AFC East has to play that schedule too. And in my opinion, they're not, none of those teams are that much better than the Dolphins. Uh, so. And I think you could make a real argument that the Dolphins have the best pocket passer in the division. So I, you know, I don't, um, I just don't see any reason why they shouldn't uh, be able to contend for it. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's going to be a fun division, and I think the Dolphins are going to be significantly better than they were a year ago. So I just felt like that was a cool little thing to bring up. Cool, you know. I just I feel like it's not it's common sense. It's like the Dolphins are not that much worse than the Bills, in my opinion. 
Um, so yeah, 10 minutes of news, ladies and gentlemen. Not a lot of news. Um, we do have a big topic, and there's some questions we have to answer related to this topic. Uh, and I did make it the thumbnail of the video, so I did want to get into it right now. I've, you know, I think there's been a lot of buzz. Um, not really. I guess maybe it's because of, you know, I don't know why this is getting so much buzz, to be honest with you. I don't care personally. Um, but you've seen a lot of pushback on Tua, and especially with this Chris Sims things that, you know, he ranked him 40, and he actually had Jarrett Stidham uh, over him. I just wanted to give my quick opinion before we get into the fan q name. The one issue that I have with the argument against Tua is the talent that he had at Alabama, um, which is insane to me. And the argument is that if you put Justin Herbert or Jarrett Sidham in that role, they would have done just as good. My counter to that is they wouldn't have ran the same offense for those guys. I think they still would have been a run-first team. I don't think they would have opened up the offense like Nick Saban did for Tua. I don't think they're the pocket passers that Tua is. I don't think they're as accurate as Tua is. I don't think the results would have been the same in such a short span that it was for Tua. I don't think neither one of those guys could have come off the bench against Georgia in the national championship game and played like Tua did. I don't think they're as good as Tua. So when people say that, it's, it's like nobody argues against it either, which is weird. And I guess that's not really what Chris's show is about. And I love Chris Sims. I think he's great. one of the best, the, to me, is the best show about football. It's not even close, in my opinion. It's, it's the most in-depth. It's the most well thought out. It's the most information you're going to get. You learn a lot about the game watching a show. Uh, but I do disagree with him on that. I don't think if you put Jer uh, Jarrett Stidham or Justin Herbert in that offense, number one, they would have changed the offense for them like they did for Tua. And number two, they're just not the pocket passer that Tua is. Um, I just don't believe that. And then the other argument against Tua is, well, he had all these first-round re receivers. Um, and people bring up uh, Henry Ruggs and... Obviously, Jerry Judy and Donovan Smith and, Jer and, and Jalen Waddle, and, and I don't even want to bring Joe Burrow into this. I just want to focus on Tua, because obviously Joe Burrow had Jamar Chase, and obviously I had uh, Edward Delaire, and he had um, uh, Justin Jefferson, and he, so he had a very good offense as well, but I want to get into the Tua thing. I've watched every snap that Tua has taken in Alabama, and I think I can confidently say that I don't know if Jalen Waddle is going to be a great receiver on the next level. I don't think he's a better receiver than than Jerry Judy is or uh, Henry Ruggs is or even Donovan Smith. I think Donovan Smith is a better receiver, but I don't think those guys are as talented as those two guys. I don't think they're I don't think Donovan Smith is as talented as Jamar Chase. I don't think um, really any of the Alabama receivers are as talented as Jamar Chase. Um, but I want to I want to specifically talk about Donovan Smith and Jalen Waddle. I think Jalen Waddle is a great tool, like very versatile type of a player. I don't know if he's a better receiver or he's even a first round receiver to the level of those guys were, that the first round receivers that we got this year. I don't think he's on those guys' level. I think Donovan Smith is probably the best receiver on the Alabama team right now. Um, but I don't think they're as talented as those guys. Uh, I don't. I, I don't think it's 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 close, and I think a little bit of that credit goes to Tua of how he was able to really spread the wealth um, on that offense. He did a very good job of really everyone was involved in that offense due to the nature of how plays were called and the way he was able to read defenses and how he gets from read one to read four so quickly. He gives the ball and distributes it and spreads it out. You know, he's not one of these college quarterbacks that has like a Mike Evans with Johnny Manziel who is just really force feeding that one guy he reads defenses you know he, he spreads the ball so I just wanted to you know push back on that a little bit that Tua that Jared Stidham and Justin Herbert could have done what Tua did in Alabama I don't think that at all and I think if you watch those players play they're very different all three of them are um and they're not the they're nowhere near the pocket passer that he is I don't I don't understand how and the, and I've we've already talked about it but the whole thing where, oh, he never had to make really tough, if you did tough throws, if you didn't watch the, you know, all of the Auburn games, or the one Auburn game, then he, the Auburn game, Alabama versus Auburn, or the LSU game, um, I, I just don't know what games you're watching, um, because he made a lot of tough throws in those games. So, he, he's a, he is a, he is a significantly more accurate quarterback than Justin Herbert, I don't think, to me that's a debate, 
and I, don't, I think he's a significantly better pocket passer than Jarrett Stidham. And he's a way better prospect than both of those guys. I don't have a problem with what Chris said. I mean, none of us really know how good these guys are going to be in the NFL. You can just project and really just compare the players as prospects. So I don't have a problem with where he ranked Tua. But I'm very confident in saying that he is a better pocket, significantly better pocket passer than both of those guys. And I think it's ridiculous um, to say otherwise, in my opinion. And I do not think, because of those reasons, because they don't have the talent that Tua had, and I think Tua is a very special, special prospect, that I don't think they could have done the same thing in Alabama. I don't care how much talent they had. And again, I think you know Shannon Sharp said something very, very true. Like, they've had great talent there. At Alabama before Tua got there, they've had Julio Jones, they've had Amari Cooper, they've had, um, you know, Calvin Ridley, countless guys. I mean, O.J. Howard. They've had all of these great players there, um, and they never changed the offense for any of those guys. I'm not saying that any of those quarterbacks were anything, you know, good, but they did have A.J. McCarron, and you could say A.J. McCarron is basically another Jarrett Sidham, maybe a little bit less athletic and maybe a little bit less of a stronger arm. Um, but they've had talent there, and they've never really changed the offense. Like any other college, uh, to, you know, they've always been a run-first team. But when Tua got there, he was such a talented guy that, like, okay, we have to hand over the keys to this guy because he is so talented. And I think that is a significant thing that not a lot of people bring up. They would not have done that for Herbert or Stedham, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that. Uh, and I, I know you guys probably have different opinions on it. but And uh, I think it is stupid to even really make this an argument. I think you can argue who's the best, who's the better prospect, but who's the better, who's going to be the better NFL quarterback? No one really knows. Um, so we'll have to wait and see on that. But I definitely think if we were all in the draft war room, there's no way we don't pick Tua over those guys, in my opinion, especially if the dude's healthy. Like, it's to me, it's not even close. All right, let's move on to the fan Q&A. And we have more on this, too, because I think some people ask that same question in the fan Q&A. So let's get into the fan Q&A where we answer fans' questions. This first question comes from Scar. He says, what's up, Skaggs? He says, I know you have Mike having a breakout year on offense. He's talking about Mike Gesicki. But who's the breakout player on defense? That's a great question. Who is the who is the breakout player on defense? Um, that is a tough question. Because um, it has to be someone who hasn't already established themselves. I think Shaq Lawson has a really good chance of becoming one of the better defensive linemen in the AFC or in the NFL in general. I could see him making a Pro Bowl uh, for sure. He's one of the best run defenders in the NFL, uh, and he got better uh, at rushing the passer. But I think in this offense, or excuse me, this defense, he's going to have a significant impact. I think he fits the defense that we run to a T. He's versatile, can run a 3-4, 4-3, multiple fronts type of a guy. And I think he can affect the game in so many different ways. And he is the guy that we needed on this front that can get us into th more third and longs and really let our secondary take control of the game. And the fact that our secondary is so strong, if we get you in those third and eights, third and sevens on a consistent basis, which Shaq lost his talent, talent allow us to do, uh, we could be one of the better third down defenses in the NFL because our secondary is so strong. So I think Shaq Lawson can really rack up the sack numbers um, in this defense and really just have a huge impact on it because I think he fits the scheme so well. So I, I think Shaq Lawson, and, and I think his close second would be Emmanuel Ogba. I think Christian Wilkins is going to have a better year. I think a lot of these guys are going to benefit from that. So I, I would, if I had to pick one, I would say Shaq Lawson. Uh, this next question comes from Jay. He says, hey, Skaggs, love your show. I really appreciate that. Uh, he says, I've been listening to it for the past three years. He says, I know you like Chris Sims, so I wanted to take on take on his blasphemous analyst of Tua and his logic on why Stidham will ultimately be a better career uh, player than Tua. It's cool if you agree with him. Thanks for all your hard work. That means a lot. Thank you, Jay. Uh, definitely not. I definitely don't agree with him. I, I think when you look at Tua as a prospect and as a player, uh, it is something that I really haven't seen in like a very long time. I think he's more polished as a quarterback than a lot of the prospects that have come out in recent memory. The way he can manipulate a defense with his head and his eyes is some, especially that early on in a career, I have never seen before. Um, I have never seen, I mean, even his first, he is meant to play quarterback. I think if you watch him play, it's like this dude is just really meant to play this position. He hits all the bells and whistles. 
he, you know, people always complain about Tannehill not having the instincts to play the position. Tua has every instinct you would ever want him to play. This dude was born to play quarterback. He was born to play football. He is going to be a great player. But he has the, he just has, he has it already built in him to be that guy. It's just, can he stay healthy, in my opinion? That's really the only issue that he has. Um or real hole in his game. Now, what, what Chris brings up is uh, Jared is a more physically gifted player. I think, number one, too, is a very underrated athlete. Um, and maybe Jared Stidham's arm is a little bit stronger. I'll, I'll, I'll concede that point. But I don't think Jared Stidham has... N- he's nowhere near as evolved as a quarterback as Tua is at this point in their career, in my opinion. I think if you ask Bill Belichick and you... If Tua Tagovailoa and Jared Stidham were on the board... There's no way I don't. I, the Bill Belichick doesn't pick Tua Tagovailoa, in my opinion. Um, I just feel like he's a better prospect. Um, his timing, his anticipation, his accuracy, like I said, his ability to manipulate the back end of a defense to create windows uh, for his receivers is something that you just don't see in young college quarterbacks. And I feel like all of that translates to the NFL. Usually when you see a college quarterback at least some of the great ones that have come out, it's not their ability to play the game. It's their physical gifts that really get them drafted in the first round. If you, The majority of guys that are picked in the first, top five, it's really physical gifts. Rarely is it someone that, oh, man, this guy just can play the game. Uh, and all of that, I think, tra- translates to the NFL level. Uh, so, yeah, I just think he's a better prospect for those reasons. You don't see Jarrett Stidham do that. You don't see Jarrett Stidham read the field like Tua Tagovailoa. And I don't care if he had a weaker offense or not, uh, and a weaker offensive line. He still doesn't show those same gifts. He still played weaker college teams. He's still Auburn. He still was on Auburn. He still played weaker teams, and he still didn't put those numbers up, and he still didn't show the ability to do what Tua did uh, as a quarterback. So I just feel like he's a better prospect. Uh, which is a great question, Jay. Uh, this next question comes from SM. He says, Mr. Skaggs, I actually anticipate your stream every Monday. Thank you. My question is, what players that were on the team last season won't make the cut this year? Thank you, SM. Um, very much appreciated, obviously. Always giving out great questions. Uh, what do I think, who do I think is not going to make the cut this year? Um, um, man, that's a tough one. Uh, most of the guys that we, you know played last year, especially on defense, definitely won't make the cut this year. Um, oh, man, that's a tough question. Uh, I would say that I think Kalen Balage I, I could see not making the roster because Miles Gaskin and Patrick Laird played, very, played better than he did last year, and... Um, I could see those guys, because again, remember, we signed Brita and we signed Howard. That's two slots are there already. And I know those two are making the roster, so who's really going to fill in behind them? I think Laird is a lock. I think what he brings to this offense and his unique... I really want us to try to move him at slot receiver, but I don't know if that'll ever happen. But what the, some of the things he can do coming out of the backfield is very is like Danny Woodhead and Shane Vereen, those type of running backs. Uh, he can really give a, give us that element in this offense. So I think what he brings to the team um, is unique. Um, and Miles Gaskin is basically just another guy, another running back, really. I don't think he's as gifted as a receiving player. So I think it's going to be tough for Kalen Balazs. He's really got to be consistent in games, I think, to make the roster. I think it's really going to come down to preseason uh, who the running back depth chart is going to be. So I would say Kalen Balazs is definitely on the hot seat. Um, I also want to point something out before I move on. Uh, Chris Sims is a great analyst, and he knows way more about football than I do. The, the dude was a former NFL quarterback. Obviously, he's you know he grew up with his father being a borderline Hall of Famer. So it you know I I just disagree with his opinion. I don't think I'd know better than he does. I just want to point that out because I don't want to come across that way. Um, you know I I can definitely think he knows more about football than what I do. I just don't see the same things he does. Um, and I just don't think he's right. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to say that. Um, this next question comes from H Y S Y A M V. He says, "How exciting is it 
that we have the Texans pick next year. I know um, it's a way, it's a ways away, but they are honestly one injury away from having a five-win season. This is a great question, A and B. Um, and you're right, they really are. I, I don't think they're going to be that. I mean, everybody in their division got better, and I, I feel like the Texans got worse. That trade of DeAndre Hopkins, I think, is not being talked about enough. That They lost a significant part of their offense. Like, a lot of their big plays downfield, and he's not a deep threat, but he is a great 50-50 ball guy. When that team needed it, a play, they went to DeAndre Hopkins. And, and he bailed, he won them a lot of games over the last two years. Like, if you think about the Cowboys overtime game, and you think about some of the games last year, his the stuff that he did w- led to them winning those games. Um, and I don't think they have that kind of a playmaker on their roster right now, other than Deshaun Watson. And I don't think their defense is anything to write home about either. So they have a lot of issues on that team, and I, I, especially offensively and defensively, I feel like that I just don't see them. They definitely didn't get better, and I feel like that division is tough enough, and I feel like now that everybody's kind of got their bearings in order, especially with the Colts, the two strongest teams in that division right now are the Colts and Titans, and the Jaguars got better as well, and Minshew is no slouch, so I feel like that Texas team, still they still have by far the best quarterback in that division, um, so that gives them a leg up on some of the teams in that division, but I feel like the teams as a whole, you can make an argument that they're third right now, and... Um, a very strong one at that. So, yeah, I, I think you make up a great point. And, and if, let's say, Deshaun Watson miss, misses, like, six games, they're done. Like, he, he can't miss any time at all, or that team is done. Um, so, yeah. You make a very good point. Very, very, very good point. That team got worse, and it's Deshaun Watson. And I feel bad for Deshaun Watson. And, and, you know, you hate to see this with younger players, where they, they like their poor their team is poorly built around them, and their career just gets wasted. for Like, this, this could be one of those years... That it's just like all right, this is a down year, and you don't want to have that year with the with a quarterback that is like Deshaun Watson, who is in his prime. It's like this is the time to continue to build and not take away, and I feel like that's what the Texans are doing. All right, this next question comes from AMV again. He says, "Hey Skags, love the show. Really appreciate that, AMV." He says, "What is Chris smoking that would have make him rank Taysom Hill, Justin Herbert, Dwayne Haskins, and Jarrett Stidham over Tua on his top forty quarterback list?" I think this is absolutely absurd, your thoughts. I mean, I, I just given, uh, you know, a lot of my thoughts on that. And, you know, uh, it is, I just feel, you know, I just disagree with a lot of the things that he said. And I, I really don't know how Justin Herbert is over at Tua. I know that he's a physically gifted player. I just don't think he's as nuanced in the position that Tua is. I think Tua is light here years ahead of Herbert in terms of playing the actual position. You know, he might have all of the t- athletic tools and he might, you know, run a little bit faster, throw a little bit farther, but he just isn't better at playing the game than Tula. Uh, the next question comes from TR3MC. He says, "Hey Skags, what would you what ha- what would have happened before Tua is in- inserted into? Oh God, I'm sorry, I butchered the heck out of that. I can't read. This que- this question comes from TR3MC. And oh, oh, by the way, MV, thank you for saying I uh, love the show. It means a lot." Uh, this question comes from TR3MC. He says, Hey, Skaggs, what would have to happen before Tua is inserted into a game, you think? I think, I don't care how bad, let's say Ryan Fitzpatrick, I keep clicking these videos, other videos. Uh, he says, I don't care how bad Ryan Fitzpatrick is playing, Playing if the quarter, if the offensive line isn't better, there's no way I'm putting Tua in, into that mess. There's just not a, there's just not a chance. So to me, it, 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 depending on how strong the offensive line is, co- in combination of how Tua is playing, if Tua is killing it and the offensive line is way better than it was a year ago, I feel like you have to play Tua. But if the offensive line didn't get better, there's no way Tua plays this year. Uh, this next question comes from SM. He says, "I would absolutely, absolutely love." This question comes from SM. He says, "I would absolutely love for Rosen to kill it." Please break down the sequence of events going into the 2020 season if Rosen outplays Fitzpatrick by a huge margin. I think that's what it would take. He has the talent to do it. It's there. He could be a very good play- And especially if the offensive line is better. And again, I, I brought this uh, this point up before. This point up before that this is the best team he's ever had around him. And if the offensive line is better, it 
significant, obviously it complements his game a lot, and I've said this a million times, Josh Rosen isn't Kyler Murray, he isn't Aaron Rodgers, he isn't Deshaun Watson, he isn't Patrick Mahomes, he cannot extend plays like they can, he just can't, he's a pocket passer, he's a Carson Palmer type of a quarterback, he's a Peyton Manning, he's a Tom Brady, those guys need an offensive line to be successful and play at their highest highest level. Now, if you're Tom Brady and Peyton Manning, you can manipulate the game and get the ball, you know, and especially with the offense, because, you know, the offense so well, they played so long, but I'm talking about early on in their career, not prime Tom Brady, not prime Peyton Manning. I'm talking about paddle on one Tom Brady and paddle on one Peyton Manning. I'm not talking about master Jedis over here. I'm talking about when they first started. You have to have that offensive line so you can learn the game and you actually have a shot to become better and you're not just getting hit every two seconds. I mean, there's so many examples in the 80s uh, when some of these great quarterbacks were coming up of them having slow starts to their career because of the, how bad their team was. Uh, and I feel like a lot of the, the reasons why you see later on quarterbacks have so much success despite... I think, I think they have more success than you know top five quarterbacks is because they go to better teams. And I think they just have a, and better organizations too. I think that, that has to come into... Uh, consideration when you're talking about some of these guys, but um, so I think all of those things benefit him, especially if the offensive line is better. I think he has a real shot to really blossom, and obviously some of the things that he needs to work on. Hopefully, he got better at uh, with uh, in a year under his belt. Plus, I think Chan Gailey's offense, with it being more simple, there's a lot less on the quarterback in terms of getting everybody in the right protections. Uh, I think really benefit him too. Again, this is another guy that's only he's only been two years into the league. And he hasn't gotten the benefit of mo- with, with most rookie quarterbacks. If you remember with Bill O'Brien, he had to change his, and a very New England style offense, he had to change the Texans offense early on in Deshaun Watson's career to really get him going uh, and get that offense going. He, he implemented a lot of some of the things that Clemson was doing into that offense. So I feel like that's, you know, and Josh really never got that treatment either. So I think simpler offense, better talent, it should really allow him to compete for the job and, um, and ultimately show out, show his talents. Um, let's see here. This next question comes from Scar. He says, I know it may happen to a lot of teams this year, but does it concern you that we might get off to a really slow start due to the COVID this season? Yes, it does. I think it concerns me just, the, you know, the install of the offense, all that stuff. You know, really dealing with the offensive line gelling. There's a lot of new faces there. We have a lot of young guys in that offensive line. So, yes, it does concern me. Uh, sorry if you hear the dog is in the background. Um, but, yeah, it does concern me. And uh, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, so, yeah, it d- definitely, it's definitely concerning. Definitely concerning. This next question comes from SM. He says, please sort out the running back depth chart, including the fullback. Um, I would say the I would just do three. I would say um, the the running back depth chart will look like this. I think you'll have Jordan Howard, Matt Brigida taking most of the snaps, and I think you're gonna have Patrick Laird in uh, in certain situations. Um, and I and I would love for the Dolphins to at least try him out as slot receiver. But um, at fullback, uh, I I don't know if this team. I mean, this is a spread offense, and I know that you know Brian Flores loves that you know the ability to get in the eye formation and stuff like that. Um, but we did have Chandler Cox, and he is a talented fullback. Uh, it's interesting to see if he makes the roster, but, but I, I think he will. This next question comes from Ethan. He says, Sir Skaggs, in your uh, prophetic wisdom, he says, who will lead the team in sacks, INTs, and receptions in 2020? Love your show. Great question, Ethan. Uh, who's going to lead the team in sacks and interceptions and receptions in 2020? I love your show. Uh, okay, um, obviously thank you, Ethan, for that, and who, I, I would say X is going to lead the team in interceptions, um, Sacks, Shaq Lawson, receptions, um, I'm going to say receptions, man, uh, part of me wants to say Isaiah Ford, but that's really contingent on, the, like, he actually, you know, gets a lot of playing time. I'm going to say Preston Williams is going to lead the team in interceptions. Um, this next question comes... That was a great question, Ethan. This next question comes from SM. He says, if New England has, like, seven wins and Miami has ten, 
What players currently on New England would you harvest in 2020 if possible? Um, not anyone really. Um, there's no one on that team that I'm like would really die to have. Um, because the secondary is, we already have a really good secondary. There's no reason to, you know, you know, take Stephon Gilmore. We already have two. We're paying two really good corners already. So, Devin McCourty's older. Um, he would be the only one that I'm looking at. Other than that, I guess, you know, I don't know, really no one. I mean, depending on how the offensive line plays, that could change my mind. Maybe like a David Andrews or a Tunier or someone like that. But no one really comes to mind. Um, this next question comes from... It was a great question, I assume. This next question comes from Logan. He says, Do you watch TD Finn's talk and Reasons Dolphins talk on YT? No, I do not. Logan, I do not watch those um, publications. Not really the word to use for that, but hey. Uh, this next question comes from Mark Jefferson. He says, I think Tua should, uh, should sit a year. Uh, what say you, Skaggs? Um, depending on the offensive line. I th I've said that a million times, but I think it's very, it's dependent on the offensive line. Uh, but it, it's an interesting question, Mark. This next question comes from Jack Pack eighteen. He says, "Who do you want to see cut the most?" For me, it's Balash. Um, I don't want to see anyone cut. Uh, I think it's a little bit more of a morbid question. Uh, so no, I don't want to see anybody cut. But I, you know, I would like everybody to get better to answer that question. Um, Jack Pack. But who do I, do I dislike the most on the team? I would I would love for Caleb Blige to get better. But yeah, Caleb Blige, you know, he had his moments last year, that's for sure. I don't think it's Dallas Thomas, Billy Turner level, where it's like, man, this really sucks. And it's definitely not Brent Grimes level, especially the end of Brent Grimes, where he was really annoying off the field and he was not playing well on the field. Um, it's not there, but it's, it's, you know. This next question comes from SM. He says... Why is there no one talking about Preston Williams and how injured he is? How is his rehab? Where is he on the wide receiver depth chart? Well, I think we did like a news story about that a few weeks ago, and it, apparently it's going well. So um, I think it said something along the lines that he should be ready for the start of the season. Um, this next question comes from Richard. He says, Chris Sims is talking foolish. Now because he has nothing to say, I knew someone that knew the Sims family. They were telling me uh, their son was better high school quarterback than Matt Sims. The only reason Matt started was because of his father's name. Matt was supposed to be the savior of New York Jets. What a joke. Okay. Well, I don't know the credibility of that story, Richard. And, uh, you know, a lot of people make excuses like that. Not just, not you know, I could see the, and I'm sure that's happened before with, like, But I've you know I've heard that many times like oh the only reason this guy's starting is because so and so and and that does happen a lot but a lot of the time some and some of the mo I would say equal amount of the times it's just that guy's not very good you know uh, and he compl and a lot of people just make excuses for themselves but I don't know how to I don't I can't speak to the credibility of that I cannot you know I can't um, I I don't know if that's true or not but yeah I, I love his I, and I. I think we've talked, I just disagree with him. And not no one's really right because we don't know, you know, how well these guys are going to play on the next level. But I do, I think he's a great analyst, has a great show, respect him a lot, and really is the only tolerable, one of the, only, one of the more only tolerable, I think that and The Ringer, uh, those two shows are the best sports shows that you can watch. I don't really like the whole ESPN thing that they're doing, and I don't like. I, I like Undisputed to a to a point, um, but most of it's really just entertainment. It's not really breaking down the game, and I feel like if you want someone to actually break down the game, really talk about the nuances of the game, uh, in, in in an intelligent way, and not just shouting at each other, I think those two shows are the best that you can watch. So really respect the, that show, and I really respect. Uh, what he's done with that show, because it's unlike really a, a lot of the shows that we have. It's like <clears throat> if you took the if you took, um, I don't know. There's not really a good example. It's not, it's really if you think about it in the history of sports shows, it's those two are really the best at it, and they're really the most unique. Like you, a lot of those sports shows are you know a lot of it's entertainment uh, and shock value. Not a lot of it's not. Uh, let's break down the game, uh, and really the nuances of the game. And on a really deep cut hardcore level, there you know I think 
thank God YouTube exists and the internet exists now because we really never had that before. And I and and uh, it's really better than Inside the NFL and a lot of those other shows as well. Like it, it's very unique, and I don't, I, I don't think a lot of people really think about those shows like that. It's like we've really never had those shows before, and those are the two shows. Like if you want your football, I would say watch the Chris, Chris Sims podcast. If you want your basketball, watch The Ringer. And it and it, it's really nice that we do have those shows because it's very it's very different than, than some of the other stuff that other people produce, um, but um, yeah. So I, I I love his show because of that. So you know, and I just disagree with it. I, and he knows way more about football than I do. So you know, and uh, so I, I do want to say that too. I mean, the man played in the NFL at a professional level, um, but I, I I just disagree with his opinion on on Tua uh, for those reasons. I just. And I'm not going to talk about it anymore. We, we already talked about it enough. So, yeah, that is the end of the show, ladies and gentlemen. It's a fascinating conversation, though. Um, it's a very fascinating conversation. Um, and, you know, I disagree with a lot of his rankings on the quarterback uh, level. I, th- I think some of the things that he says about uh, why Tom Brady is the 15th best quarterback in the league, I disagree with as well. And, I, and, I, and I'm not a Patriots guy at all, and, and you guys know that. So uh, there's a lot of things I disagree with him about but that doesn't mean his show isn't awesome and he doesn't know what he's talking about so anyway that i am skyx1083 um and that's it that's it for the show hope you guys enjoyed it i listen i i knew the show was going to be long because the lack of content to talk about but we tried you know we tried and i want to point out something else you know this show i really like to model after those shows you know i really do i think those shows Because if we didn't, we would just have the SPN uh, to contrast the other.